meeting for Thursday, October 14th. We're just coming back from closed session. Um, and before we start with the agenda, would our clerk, Chloe, like to say a few words? Yes, thank you, Mayor Brooks. Hello and welcome to the Capitola City Council meeting. In accordance with California Senate Bill 361, this meeting is not physically open to the public. Council and staff are meeting via Zoom and there are several ways for the public to watch and participate. Information on how to join the meeting using Zoom or a landline or mobile phone, along with how to submit public comment during the meeting tonight is available on our website, cityofcapitola.org and on the published meeting agenda. The public can also live stream the meeting on our website. As always, the meeting is cablecast live on Charter Communications Cable TV Channel 8 and is being recorded to be rebroadcast on the following Wednesday at 8 a.m. and on Saturday following the first rebroadcast at 1 p.m. on Charter Channel 71 and Comcast Channel 25. Our technician tonight is Walter. Thank you, Walter, and thank you, Mayor Brooks. Thank you. If you can all now please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. So now this brings us to item two, a report out in closed session. Our city attorney, Samantha. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, we had closed session on the two items on the agenda and no action was taken. Thanks so much. And on to item three for additional materials. Do we have any additional materials? We did not, Mayor Brooks. And for item four additions and or deletions to the agenda? That has no changes in this evening, but I will note that on your consent calendar, there's a uh, a recommendation to continue a hearing of uh, a second reading of the ordinance to adopt the library lease. So if anybody's here for that, that item is recommend, recommended to be continued till October 28th. Thank you. Now on to item five, this is oral communications. This allows times for members of the public to address the city council on any consent items on tonight's agenda or any topic within our jurisdiction of the city that is not on the general gover government. Members of the public may speak up for up to three minutes, otherwise, or unless specified by myself. Individuals may not, speak, uh, may not speak more than once during our oral communications, and all speakers must address the entire legislative body and will not be permitted to engage in dialogue. Do we have anyone from the public who would like to say something? Mayor Brooks? Or you can I do not see anyone with their hands raised. Okay, and you also, if you're watching, you can email us as well. Okay, see, so and then we'll move on to item six. This is a, our staff and city council comment opportunity. We'll begin with staff. Mayor and council, I have a very exciting announcement to make this evening. As you are well aware, earlier this year, Chief McManus announced a plan to retire coming up this fall. Um, as council's aware, we conducted a nationwide search for a new police chief that included a competitive testing process, as well as panelists comprised of community members, um, a professional police chiefs panel, as well as a panel, internal panel that included representatives from the city council, including council member Peterson and council members Kaiser. Following that process, and based on a strong recommendation from the interview panelists, I have named Captain Andrew Daly as our next police chief in Capitola. Andy began his career in Capitola back in 1999 after serving five years in Butte County with the SO's office there. During his 22 years here before with Capitola, he served in a number of roles, including officer, detective, field training officer, sergeant, most recently police captain. And on November 14th, he will get to add police chief to that list. So Andy's appointment is a testament not only to his work ethic and commitment, um, but also to the strong culture and dedication of our entire police force. So with that, please say welcome me and congratulating Andy on this position. Congratulations, Andy. We are so thrilled to have you as our new captain, or excuse me, our new chief. How dare I say that? 
um, our new chief of police. Um, would you like to say a few words? Sure, uh, and <clears throat> uh, thank you, uh, City Manager Goldstein and Mayor Brooks Council and, and the rest of the department heads, and I see Chief uh, McManus here. I'm truly uh, humbled and honored to, to, to take this position. And uh, it's, I'm really looking forward to working with all of the community, uh, the, the department heads, and then uh, importantly, the, the men and women of, of the police department. And we have just an amazing group of people here. And I'm really looking forward to just um, re-engaging with the community and, uh, and, and just the, the projects that we can work on moving forward. So I'm really excited. Um, truly humbled and, and very thankful. So thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm really looking forward to it. So thank you. Well, thank you. And would any of our council members like to say a few words? I see council member Bertrand and then vice mayor Story, council member Peterson, council member Kaiser, the room is blowing up for you. Let's start with council member Bertrand. Well, I, I learned what a bear hug was the other day. I, I, I passed by Andy coming out of the police department and it was just like, congratulations. It was like, this is big, huge bear hug. And so now I know what a real bear hug is. And um, truly, I, I remember when I heard your stories and I heard how you became a police officer in Capitola and, you know, you, you told me how it came about. And I think we were doing a ride along. And so I, I, I've heard your story since the beginning as you worked your way up. So congratulations, you worked your way up and you've done a lot of hard work to get to this point. Um, truly um, just an exceptional individual. I like your demeanor. I like how you view the community and you're gonna be a great asset to Capitola. But I'd also like to point out one other thing. I, I'm really grateful for our police department because our police department has provided the options for people within the department to advance. It has provided the options to train people for circumstances that they will be using, needing to need, uh, needing to use in this modern day police environment. So you've taken advantage of those. Most recently, I think you had a management training course and you're gonna be put to task, I'm sure, very soon. Thank you. Vice Mayor Story. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Brooks. Um, I just want to say I, I can't be more pleased that we have uh, appointed someone that uh, has been committed to the city of Capitola for so many decades, and someone who really knows the community of Capitola. Um, and I think that, that's that's. Um, uh, a big step forward for uh, community policing. Um, and um, so congratulations. And uh, with deference to Chief McManus, um, I want to be one of the first to say congratulations, Chief Daly. Thank you. Council Member Kaiser. Thank you, Mayor, Andy, Captain, Chief. You've, you've done it all, so I just have to give my huge gratitude to you. And it's true, we all see what you do in the community and how far you've come with us and um, how many doors this is actually opening for our department and our city as a whole. And uh, just my hat off to you. I'm so proud of you and I'm so happy that um, we, I, Kristen and I got to be part of the panel, which was like a huge, I think for me personally, and it was like a great experience. And that aside, I'm just really happy that we got to this point and congratulations, you definitely deserve it. Council Member Peterson. Thank you. Yes, Captain Dolly, uh, soon to be Chief Dolly. Uh, as, as much as we will hate to see Chief McManus go, I could not imagine uh, a better replacement and and someone to continue to lead our police department within our city um you've done so much over the years for our city and and now to continue in leading this department it's just going to be absolutely fantastic so congratulations we are so excited to have you uh at the at the helm in the in the police department well i think my fellow council members have said exactly what i I've, I've been thinking Andy, 
we're, I'm just so proud of you and you have built yourself a legacy here in the city of Capitola. And this is just such an extraordinary community. And to, to have you lead, not just the police department, but all of us um, into what I think is gonna be an exceptional future for, for the city and for, for everyone here as we, we um, overcome a lot of, of tragedy and, and, and the pandemic and as we rebuild a resilient community, I'm just happy that it'll be you leading, leading the way and supporting all of us. So congratulations again. I'm so happy for you, and I look forward to working with you more. Chief McManus, we shall celebrate soon. All right. It's always odd because we're here in Zoom, and I'm getting excited, and I want to clap, and I want us to jump up and down, but it's awkward. We're, we're, on, we're on little screens here. So um, we're going to move on. Thanks again, um, unless there was someone else. Okay. So we're gonna now move on to our rest of our council comment time. Do any council members have any comments? Uh, council member Kaiser. Thank you, Mayor. I just have two things to touch on. Um, we are doing our um, plan air art, um, ex I guess it's on exhibit. It's more like an activity for local and non-local artists to participate um, in our town and paint our beautiful scenery. So it's happening between uh, November 1st and 6th. So I want people to be aware that there'll be artists out and about and that it's actually kind of a cool process to watch. Um, uh, they each have different visions of our city and of our town. And so it's really cool to watch the, the works um, be done. And then um, there'll be an exhibit at the end of it so people can purchase art and support um, hardworking artists, which is really exciting. Um, another thing on top of that, seeing as how we do all um, a lot of events throughout Capitola, I just wanted to give a huge shout out to our public works. Um, we've just gone through, we kind of get these weekends row after row of Art and Wine and Labor Day and Beach Festival and the fireworks and our public works employees are just a huge backbone of a lot of those um, big festivals and big activities that we are lucky enough to do here. Um, you know, they step up, they do the job, and it, it without them, we wouldn't be able to have those special times here. And so I just want to make a big shout out to them and to Steve Jesper, who, who is the head of all of them. And all the manpower is so necessary and much, much appreciated from us as a, as a council and as the city, we couldn't do without you. So thank you guys very much for all of your hard work and your, your, and your yes attitude. You guys are yes guys. So couldn't do it without you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Council member Kaiser. Steve, don't dare tell us what the score is if you're watching, because I'm recording it. Uh, Council Member Bertrand. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Um, I had several people come up to me after the fireworks, and uh, as you know, I walk around the city and just compliment us. And you know, I had to tell them it's Nomani Foundation, it's a partnership thing. And so I'd like to um, request that uh, we have. Mr. Monty, come in and tell us what he's done, his history, and the number of children's activities and programs that he's helped support in Capitola. Um, that's my first thing. Um, second thing is a uh, week from this Friday, I will be taking a ride on the rail. Uh, it's a TIGM a demonstration. I was lucky to get a spot. It filled up really quickly. Um, I'll be glad to sort of give people an update. I'll be leaving from Santa Cruz and, and get off in Capitola or go back to Santa Cruz. Um, I did attend the first night out at J Street Park and uh, it wasn't as big as before because we didn't have a barbecue and a few other things and we almost didn't have it. So thanks for the police department for putting that on. Uh, there was a climbing structure there and I saw a lot of very enthusiastic kids, you know, climbing up, you know, handholds and stuff like that. It, it was just truly amazing. So, um, and then other thing related to um, RTC, I've been appointed to a commission or a committee. Um, I'm gonna find out more about it tomorrow. 
It's called the CRCC, and basically its function is to try to um, work on policy issues to help uh, public transportation from San Francisco down to Santa Barbara. And uh, as you know, it's been slowly going down the coast, uh, excuse me, going down the 101 corridor. I think we get to, um, well, I'll find out more. So I'll give you some updates on that later. And um, as you also know, I was at the California League, and I'm going to try to prepare a short report, uh, some highlights that I think people might find interesting. And that's it. Thank you so much, Councilmember Bertrand. Councilmember Peterson. Thank you. Uh, first, I wanted to share that uh, I am uh, the, the city's representative to the Santa Cruz Metro Transit District, and we recently had a uh, workshop with the board members, which was a great opportunity to learn more about the organization and where it's headed, our strengths and weaknesses, et cetera. And uh, one of the things I wanted to share is that um, for those of you who do use the metro system, please have patience. We have a shortage of drivers right now, and our drivers are working incredibly hard to meet all of our uh, needs to, to address that shortage. So please have patience, and if you do use the metro uh, bus system, uh, give a shout out to your driver and thank them for, for, being, uh, for being there and continuing to get us around. Uh, the other thing I wanted to share was at last night's AMBAG meeting, the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments. Once again, we heard about our um, regional housing needs assessment and the methodology that's being used to determine uh, the allocation for each area. The final allocation for the housing that's needed in our city in particular will not be final until about February. Um, but they do have estimates right now. And I just wanted to share that in the 2015 to 2023 RENA cycle, the last RENA cycle, our entire city had a needs assessment of 143 new, new homes that needed to be built. The estimate for the upcoming RENA cycle is 726. And uh, about 214 of those are in the very low income category. So we have more houses that need to be built in the very low income category in this RENA cycle than we had required for all income categories in our prior RENA cycle. So I'm going to continue to share this information as we get more information coming in from AMBAG and from um, uh, HCD at the state because this is really important and I think that it's going to be crucial that we stay updated on this information as we move forward um, be, so that it's not a shock for us when our final numbers come out and we need to be able to determine how to ensure that we can uh, create opportunities for that kind of housing. And that's all for me tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Peterson. Um, I just had a, a couple of things to share. I just first wanted to thank um, Senator John Laird for taking his, the time to visit um, our visit with us uh, staff and with our, our city manager over at our new library he was able to give us some new updates on what's going on and some recently passed bills. Also on um, October 18th, I'll be having my mayor's town hall with our guests from the Central Coast Community Energy 3CE. The event will begin at 6 p.m. and they'll be presenting um, uh, a, a presentation on understanding the value of community choice energy. And so um, to access that Zoom link, you can go onto our website. And then following in November, I'll be having one with our county, Santa Cruz County Superintendent, Ferris the Boss. So all that information can be found on our website. Now moving on to item seven, this is consent. All items listed on consent will be enacted by one motion in the form listed below. And um, there will be no separate discussion on these items prior to the time the council votes on the action unless a member of the city council would request would like to request an item to be discussed for separate review. Would anyone like to pull any of the items that they see on tonight's agenda? For consent, excuse me. This is items A through G. Okay, seeing none, I'll go ahead and entertain a motion. Would I? So moved. We have a first for approval of consent items A through G. Do we have a second? I'll I have a second from Vice Mayor Story. Can we have a roll call, please? Yes. Councilmember Bertrand. I approve. Councilmember Kaiser. Aye. Councilmember Peterson. Aye. Vice Mayor Story. Aye. Mayor Brooks. Aye. 
Okay, that item passes. We'll now move on to our general government and public hearing. This is item 8A for a redistricting presentation. And tonight, all we're going to be doing, um, our recommended action is just to accept the presentation. And who will be presenting? Is this you, Alyssa, or Elisa? Excuse me. Nice can you guys hear me you. okay? We can. Great, thank you. And it's good to hear about the plein air um, event in November. I'm going to come check it out. So thank you for inviting me tonight. Um, my name is Elisa Benson. I'm the Assistant County Administrative Officer and part of the core team in the county uh, that is running our uh, redistricting project for 2021. So I have a brief presentation, really just focusing on our process, which is a little bit different, given everything feels a little bit different in the last year and a half, um, but I'm happy to take any questions. And I'm going to share my screen. I have two border colleagues here with me, so hopefully they won't be uh, involving themselves at all. So let's see. Can you guys see that okay? Let's know I have to actually hit this button. Let's see. Can you see that all right? Great. So just very briefly, so this is obviously just going to be covering the county's redistricting process. But as I'll reference in the very end of the presentation, there are several. And let me move this along. Figure out how to do it. Oh, gosh. Not letting, here we go. Will it let me? Let's see, next. So, just very quickly, I know all of you are familiar with this, but why does redistricting matter? Um, for And this is more for any of the members of the doing public. So, redistricting is redrawing those bound district boundaries for uh, purposes of um, representation. And we do this every 10 years as part of um, coming after the decennial census. The intention here is that these boundaries are drawn equal and substantial substantially equal to allow for um, fair representation in any kind of elected body. And as you, you all know very well, this is, this is about who um, is going to be, uh, who, where the elected representation comes from. Really key in these efforts are population equality. So you take that entire population of the, the uh, legislative body you're talking about and you split it into the number of districts and then it's drawing those boundaries. And it's really important to have community voice and representation in drawing those, those boundaries. I think there's um, unfortunately a, a long history where that hasn't been necessarily done in a way that has been fair to all members of the community. So it's, it's something that um, what, what we really do want to hear what community members um, think and want in terms of representation. And this is how folks have the opportunity to, to get that elected representation. For us, for the County of Santa Cruz, uh, we, well, I first should say there was some legislation uh, at the state level called, uh, it's AB 849, the Fair Maps Act, and this was actually in 2018 and 2019. There was a smoke alarm going off in my kitchen, by the way. Um, and that actually really uh, quite significantly uh, changed the way California approaches redistricting, really set up a whole set of new standards and expectations. And one of those things that, is it really defined the ways in which um, community participation uh, could, be, could be established. So for the purposes of the county, the board in February chose to do an advisory redistricting commission. And there are some limitations on who could be appointed to those. One of the big, big ones is you can't have anyone who works for a current elected official or someone who intends to work for a current elected official. So what you see here is the um, commissioners that, that the uh, Board of Supervisors by district um, appointed to participate in, an, our, in our, advisory, uh, our advisory commission. So I wanted to just spend a, a brief moment talking a little bit about that line drawing criteria that AB 849 set forward. And this is, so really it is, this decision process is governed both at the commission level and at the board level by both federal and state law. I won't go into the, the details of this, but it, first and foremost, it's around equal population and, and complying with the Voting Rights Act. And then the state requirements, which AB 849 has now set up, is this list of five ranked criteria 
that need to be part of the consideration for drawing boundaries and as well as the sort of foundational concept that nobody should shall adopt district lines that either discriminate or favor of any political party. So that's really the structure that I'm mean, guiding both the advisory commission and uh, the board of supervisors uh, process moving forward. So very quickly, the timelines lines and phases, because of how COVID affected the census, uh, the census collection in 2020, it really affected redistricting. And uh, frequently, um, well, as it, historically, we get our census numbers in April, which provides a fairly long time frame for redistricting work to happen. Because of COVID, we did not receive redistricting, or we did not receive census data, we even got early data in late August. And then there's a whole timeline that, you know, basically comes into play because of then the following elections in 2022. So for us, we had started doing our planning quite in, in the spring once we had the advisory uh, commission appointed by the board. It's in July and August, really, we launched a website. And by the way, the AB 849 requires a website and a whole bunch of very specific outreach activities. Um, we developed some tools and we started to uh, reach out to community organizations around promoting involvement and education about the redistricting process. In September and October, we moved more in towards our involvement, our public involvement and engagement work. And then really we're right now in the thick of the line drawing mapping work with the advisory commission. And again, why this, this time frame got so um, constrained is the data. We did not have the data for the county in terms of what does our population change look like. And we received that initially on August 20th. It was an early set that had not yet um, integrated what they call the reapportionment with at the state level um, residents who are in state prisons basically then get, get identified and then the uh, numbers for each county is adjusted to like if they were back in their county, what would that do? For us, that period between August 20th and September 20th, while the state was doing that reapportionment, was very minor in terms of how it changed the census data we had received earlier. But still, that you had to wait till that official data was available. So our commission, um, with staff support, we offered four different public workshops a general public workshop workshop um, on September 1st. And then we did sort of regional workshops on the 22nd, the 29th and the 30th. Um, these were all, we, we did both a, a hybrid approach. We wanted to make sure we had optimal um, opportunity for the public to be involved. Unfortunately, we did not have a whole lot of um, public engagement. Uh, I think our most are most well attended in person and, uh, and quite frankly, in terms of um, remote attendance was the workshop we did on September 29th in Felton. So sort of in the district five area of the county. So uh, we were, we've been, you know, not, we're not too surprised why we haven't had a whole lot of attendance. And that's because the data basically um, shows that we weren't, we didn't have very significant swings in terms of population changes by district. And I do have a slide on that if anyone's interested in that. Just as the current map stands, um, we are substantially equal by district. And the legal frame we use for that is that the variance from that, that number, and in our, in our case, it's about 54,000 people per district was less than 5%. And if, as long as you're, if you're less than 5%, it's considered substantially equal. So even as it stands in, with our new data, there's like from a number st standpoint, we, we meet the substantially equal standard. So we, once that, those engagement work was completed, and I should say we were getting public um, input online uh, around the, the key concept of communities of interest. And that's, that's really the idea here is 
how do communities consider themselves and, and communities of interest. Um, so it was last week on, a, on uh, October 6th, our advisory group started meeting to sort of take that input that we re received either through the web or um, in their own community conversations or through the engagement process to start talking about what potential changes would uh, they would want to consider recommending to the board. So that started last week. We had a meeting yesterday and we have another meeting tomorrow and those are all Brown Acted meetings. Uh, they're available on our website. We, they are taking testimony tomorrow and then we will be moving from that process to the board process. So that's really this next part of uh, the slide that you see here, the October through December process. One of the features of AB 849 was it requires four public hearings by the, by the board making, um, making that final decision. One of those public hearings can actually be um, one of the workshops. So we um, are counting our, our, our September 30th workshop as our first public hearing, and that was an, an evening hearing in Watsonville. Then we will then have three additional meetings on this. Uh, a public hearing on the 26th, the evening of the 26th. That will be when the uh, Advisory Commission's recommendations will be presented to the board and received by the board. Any of these meetings, uh, we will continue to take public input and testimony. We will then have a, what is technically the second public hearing at the board, but the third in the count to four on November 9th. We expect that will be where we, um, we actually expect to get additional direction from the board on the 26th about any proposals that they want us to um, pre prepare for them in terms of different maps and what those changes would look like in terms of population um, on the 26th. And then there will be a net, another hearing on the 9th. Um, again, public testimony will be welcomed at, at that hearing. At this point, we're then planning for final action on November 16th. The 9th and the 16th are regular uh, Board of Supervisor meetings. This will be a time certain item on their agenda. The 26th is a special meeting in the evening. Um, and so the intention there is that they would actually adopt any, any changes to the map on November 16th. One of the features of AB 849 is those maps that are uh, being considered for adoption have to be published at least seven days prior to final adoption. So those things will come out, gosh, what, I should be able to do my math. But that, on November 9th, or the next day, we actually have to um, have those published. We do, I have listed here this deadline. Um, the deadline for, for the board to take action is December 15th. If we do not, then the whole process um, reverts to a court process. So we just had planned this schedule where um, the intention was we got it done sooner than later. And then if we did need to, if the board felt they needed additional time, we would be able to fit in another meeting before December 15th. So this is our process and really we will be accepting public testimony from any interested party um, at all of these meetings. Um, and we will see how things go. So with that, I just want to also point out we are not the only ones who are, who are doing redistricting. Um, of course, there's state redistricting, and then the city, um, city of Santa Cruz is doing it. Uh, there is redistricting at Cabrillo. Many different folks are doing redistricting. Um, so that is my, uh, my overview of the process. I'm happy to take any questions, and, if, and we can just go from there. I'm going to so much. on my screen. I can find it. There we go. Okay. Any questions from council? Vice Mayor Story. Thank you, Mayor Brooks, and uh, thank you, Ms. Stinson, for that presentation and and getting us better informed about the redistricting process. Uh, I guess um, I had uh, three questions, and I was wondering uh, when the um, recommended uh, maps and plans come out after October 15th, whether uh, residents who are going to be affected 
uh, those recommendations will get special noticing. Um, my second question was whether the um, recommendations are subject to lasso concurrence. Um, and I guess my third um, question is whether any um, of the, so far, the, uh, the commission's uh, meetings on recommendations and, and proposed maps affects Capitola in any way. Okay, I'll try and get to all of those. Um, in terms of the first I, the first question around special noticing. We would we are not planning on any special noticing, but we are planning on well, we will meet the noticing requirements, which would are five days before the 26th, when they would come to the board. They need to be public, but we plan to be you know putting forward a more general press and um, just trying to bring the public's attention to any of the changes that. The, our commission might be recommending. So while there's no requirement for them, um, we absolutely want to encourage people to understand any of the changes that are recommended by ARC to the board. I should also just say there is a, there is a reasonable, um, there's a reasonable scenario that they would, they would recommend leaving the district boundaries as they currently are. So um, I just want to mention that because we do meet that substantial um, equality standard. That said, we do have to also be able to say, we, and we don't think that we, by leaving them status quo, that we are somehow disrupting an articulated community of interest that's arrived since 2011. So that, you know, it's not as simple as like, oh, it's substantially equal, we can leave it alone. It's like, and we believe that those, those criteria are still met by by that proposed um, status quo mapping. Um, I, I do not believe there is any um, interactions with LAFCO on this, but I would actually have to check with my county council to confirm that. And when we re read over this, this, uh, the, uh, the law, it, it's not making a connection there. Um, so I, I'll just say that, but I would have to actually double check with county council. I will say that there have been um, some discussions by the commissioners uh, that could affect Capitola, but that's, the, those are not things that have been agreed to at this point, and tomorrow is when they will be looking at, um, at those, those specific proposals. Thank you. Any other questions from council? Okay. Um, let's go ahead and move this to public comments or questions. Um, so now we'll open this up for public comment uh, for this item. If you'd like to make a comment, you can send an email now to public comment at ci.capitola.ca.us. Or to speak, please raise your hand now by clicking on reactions, then clicking raise hand in your Zoom application. Or by dialing star nine or star six, depending on the type of phone or landline you have. Our moderator will unmute you and you will have up to three minutes to speak. Mayor Brooks, we have an attendee wishing to speak on this item. Um, it is Janet. Yes, I just have one quick question. Where would somebody go look online to see what the current situation is or what you're planning or whatever? Absolutely. You would go to the, I'm going to actually have to look up the website because I don't know it by heart, but I think it is ARC 21. I'm going to have to look at it really quickly and I can probably, and am I able to put stuff in the chat or I'm, because I could put it there too. I think um, chat might be disabled. Okay. Let me just pull it up really quick. <laughs> Uh, the website is, why is it not telling me? If you just, if you just go ARC, ARC 21 Santa Cruz, it will take you to the redistricting 2021 website. And there everything is posted in terms of um, proposed maps, map changes that the commissioners are discussing. 
Uh, the schedules are there and we absolutely welcome um, anyone's participation in this process. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Okay, any other questions from the email or from the audience? Mayor Brooks, I do not see any other attendees wishing to speak on this, and I do not have any emails. Okay, well, thank you so much, Elisa, for being here tonight. Thank you, Vice Mayor Story, for bringing this to our community's attention. For everyone watching or watching this later, please do check out the website to get involved and to see what's going on um, and to be able to offer input um, should there be any changes discussed for the uh, city's boundary lines. Thanks again. We'll now move on to item B, and there's a part, there's two parts. Um, so this is uh, B, or excuse me, 8B, consider an agreement with Caltrans to include Highway 1 ramp signals in the adaptive, adaptive signal project. And the recommended action tonight is twofold to approve an agreement between the city and the California Department of Transportation Caltrans for installation, operation, and maintenance of adaptive traffic management system and authorize the public works director Mr. Jesper to sign the agreement and two authorize the city manager to issue a contract change order to bear electric solutions the contractor for the 41st Avenue traffic signal adaptive coordination project in an amount not to see exceed four hundred thousand dollars to add two Caltrans intersections to the project talk about a run-on sentence guys um, whew. Sorry okay about that. Steve, <laughs> this is your yeah, idea. Um, this is actually a, a great item to have, um, something we've been working on. And if I can share my screen here, you should see my screen now. I see it in a weird format though. Slide presentation format. Yeah, there you go. Oh. I'm sorry. Try that again. All right, the item for you is a kind of an update on the 41st Avenue adaptive traffic signal project. Um, as you were in August, not too long ago, the city council awarded a contract to Bear Electric to install the adaptive signal control system in the city of Capitola. And on the map that's on front of you now, the Capital signals are here in red. And so those are approved and they are gathering the equipment to start work on that. The county also has uh, using the same system for their green intersections here on SoCal Drive and the top of 41st Avenue. And at the time we awarded the contract, the three, actually two intersections, but it involves kind of three signals here in the middle were are owned and operated by Caltrans and we did not have an agreement with them to uh, install the system in their signals at that time. Um, kind of just give you that interagency coordination I went over, this is in writing, form Capitola, bunch in, bunch in the, the county of Santa Cruz. And at that time, uh, nothing from Caltrans and Mayor Brooks um, did send a letter to the director of District 5 of Caltrans and that seems to shake things loose. So we have an updated here. Um, since that letter has gone out, uh, Caltrans has agreed to, in, to the installation of adaptive equipment at their intersections. The agreement that's in the agenda was provided by Caltrans and reviewed by our city attorney. Uh, Caltrans has now provided comments on the plans for their work in their system. Uh, we're revising the plans so that they can approve them. An approval and upon approval of the agreement and the finalized plan, um, Caltrans will issue us an encroachment permit and we can get a price from the contractor to install those uh, systems in the Caltrans intersections. This is huge. We've been working on this for almost three or four years now, it feels like. Um, so this is a big deal. And the Air Board grants that we have will cover the cost to do the work on the Caltrans intersection. Um, just to give you an update on the timing, so the contractor has ordered materials from the city, getting the controllers and the cameras and everything that's involved is about a four to six week process. Um, upon approval of the change order, which we're anticipating for the Caltrans equipment, they have to reorder 
a whole new set of equipment, so it's going to kind of delay things a little bit, four to six weeks, but they currently anticipate that we'll start working on the city systems in November, and depending on how quickly they get the other equipment, we'll complete in December, January. Of course, with the holidays, you just never know, but so it should begin by uh, this winter. We're very excited about that. So the recommendations, I'll go ahead and read them one more time since it's so long and simple. So we're going to ask you to approve the agreement with, with, between the city and California Department of Transportation, Caltrans, for the installation, operation, and maintenance of the adaptive traffic management system and authorize myself to sign the agreement and to authorize the city manager to issue a contract change order to bear electric solutions uh, for the, to add the Caltrans intersections in amount not to exceed $400,000. That $400,000 um, is the amount of the grant that we have. Uh, we do anticipate being less than that, although we're not quite sure. It really depends on the final plans that are approved by Caltrans. And the reason we're asking for this advanced uh, kind of authority for the city manager to approve the change order is just, hey, we don't have to come back to you. Um, another item, another look at this project. And it may provide an opportunity since we have uh, fewer meetings in November and December uh, to just keep the project moving forward. So uh, that's why we're asking for the authority for the city manager. And if that's my uh, report, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Steve. Any questions from council on this item? Okay, seeing no questions, we'll take this to the public. Um, now I'll open this up for public comment. If you'd like to make a comment, send an email now to public comment at ci.capitola.ca.us or to speak, please raise your hand now by clicking on reactions then clicking raise hand in your Zoom application or by dialing star nine or six, depending on your landline mobile phone. And our moderator, Larry, will unmute you. You will have up to three minutes to speak. Mayor Brooks, we have an attendee wishing to speak. It is uh, Janet. Yes, thank you. Um, I applaud you at doing this uh, adaptive signal project. It has been a piece that has been needed to help with some of the traffic problems on 41st Avenue. As a resident of Gross Road, I would ask that once it was installed, you give the eastbound Gross Road intersection more time in the rotation during the day. The, I have been at this light as the third car in line and find that the light turns yellow just as I get to go to the intersection. Mm -hmm. This um, results often time in people going through a red light. Uh, there was often more than three vehicles trying to make this turn, and then the next time is more than two and a half minutes. Um, and there are always cars waiting. So thank you very much for doing this, and I appreciate all your good work. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Any other comments from the public on this item? Mayor Brooks, I do not see any attendees with the, their hands raised, and I do not have any emails. Okay, so we'll bring this back to council for further comments and discussion and an approval. Who would like to begin? Vice Mayor Story. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Brooks. I would like to begin and end by moving the staff recommendation. I like okay. it. We've got a first from Vice Mayor Story and a second from Council Member Bertrand. Any other comments? Okay, may I have a roll call, please? Councilmember Bertrand? I approve. Councilmember Kaiser? Aye. Councilmember Peterson? Aye. Vice Mayor Story? Aye. Mayor Brooks? Aye. Thank you so much, Steve. This is um, such wonderful news. I'm very excited about seeing this happen. Um, now on, I, on to item C. This is a consideration of first readings of an ordinance amending chapter 18.02, affordable inclusionary housing, and an ordinance adding chapter 18.05 for affordable housing impact fees. Katie, is this your item? This is my item. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you. Okay. Good evening, Mayor Brooks and Council. Before you tonight is an update to our inclusionary housing ordinance as well as a uh, new chapter 15. Um, 
18.05 to include impact fees for affordable housing. Um, I just want to give you a quick overview of our affordable housing ordinance as it stands today, the process that we've been through um, over the past year, and uh, how we've taken all the information that the uh, City Council has provided us in direction and put this into new updates. Um, so when we look at our inclusionary housing ordinance, we look at the area median income for the average income defined within a G geographical area. And on the slide is the 2020 AMI for Santa Cruz County per household. An inclusionary housing ordinance is the local uh, ordinance that requires housing developers to include a dedicated amount of affordable housing units within a project. At the city of Capitola, we currently require one unit for every seven. Um, well, once you build seven, you're required to produce 15% of the on-site units must be affordable. Um, on this slide, I show the inclusionary units that have been built in Capitola to date. Uh, Capitola Beach Villas with eight, Heritage Lane with two, Pearson Court with one, and then most recently, Terra Court with one. Um, so within our existing um, inclusionary housing ordinance or requirements, we have a requirement that anytime you build a 50% um, or more addition to your home, you're required to pay a fee of $2.50 per square foot. Um, any new single family home, there's a fee of $10 a square foot. New developments of two to six units of for sale are required to pay a fee of $10 a square foot. And as I had just mentioned, any new development with seven or more has to produce 15% of, those, uh, of the total units have to be inclusionary units for on-site and rental units that are produced um, are required to pay a $6 per square foot. So we, you may recall some of you, um, Council Member Kaiser was not on the council at the time, but back in 2020, we came to the city council with six policy questions. And I wanna say that was last August of 2020 and we, the questions that we asked really had to do with the existing IHO and whether or not to keep the, the, um, the IHO as it was drafted or, or in place, or should we start making amendments to our IHO? Um, so the first question we asked was, should we maintain the existing 15%? Uh, we asked about whether or not we should require rental to continue to provide a, an impact, pay a fee, or should we um, exempt them from the IHO, knowing that rental units are a very valuable resource in our city. Uh, we also asked what larger development um, of what we should be requiring when someone builds one to six units. Um, and also, should we consider an in lieu fee rather than on-site unit? Would the city council support amendments to the asset limitations within our IHO? And then should we look at alternatives to just on-site development within the IHO? So um, the next we focused on asset limitations. There was a modification to one of the mobile home parks um, to their development agreement. Or, um, and we talked about asset limitations within that first meeting as well and really carving out new asset limitations for senior housing within Capitola, so uh, 55 plus and meets the definition of a California senior housing development and within our inclusionary housing for non-senior. Uh, the current asset limitations or the, we allow up to 1.5 times the amount of your income uh, when buying an affordable unit and as people are saving for retirement, uh, it's good to include asset limitations so that um, you're not, we're looking at the assets, but making sure the assets aren't uh, too high in which somebody could buy a unit straight up. Um, and then next, what happened over the last year is we received some grant money to actually help us answer some of the very difficult questions we brought to you. So um, we, we received money and utilized that money to do a nexus study to look at what, to, what it truly costs, um, what the need is within Capitola, what it costs to develop units, and also look at the feasibility of at what point 
knowing what um, how many units we need to develop within the city um, at what point does putting that demand on the developer become infeasible so we hired EPS consultants they presented to the City Council on September 9th and utilizing all the data they brought forward the council was able to give us some really clear direction on um, what we should be incorporating into our draft update to the IHO. So you'll recall during the feasibility results, we did see that our current ordinance with the 15% inclusionary um, is shown on the far left of this graph was found to be not feasible because it's such a burden on the developer. But in combination with a, um, in, in lieu fee, um, a developer giving, giving the developer a choice of going up to $25 per square foot, um, it makes that feasible if they have an alternative. So that was, um, we, that was one of the big takeaways. So now I'm gonna go through what we heard from the city council and from this, this from the information we gathered from you, um, that's what we based our draft ordinance on. So first, we heard from the city council to maintain the existing 15% inclusionary requirement for developments with seven or more units. Um, in combination, as I just uh, mentioned, allowing the housing developer an option to pay an in lieu fee rather than produce the required inclusionary site, um, housing units on site to ensure that the a project could be feasible um, consistent with the studies. Next, um, we were directed um, to uh, update the city's affordable housing in lieu fees and adopt new housing impact fees as supported by the study. So uh, the city council directed us to um, add affordable housing impact fees and for multifamily rental developments, uh, keep, keeping that at $6 a square foot adding an affordable housing impact fee for those structural additions um, that are greater than 50%, keeping that at $2.50 a square foot. And then the increased fee comes into um, effect for those developments that are six or less, so it would be a new impact fee of $25 a square foot. And then allowing an in lieu fee, so where they have an option to developing on-site units for when there's seven or more units, also of $25 per square foot. So these first three fees that we mentioned up top, the affordable housing impact fees, this is the area in which we're creating the new Municipal Code Chapter 18.05, which is uh, the first reading tonight is for that. Because um, legally, um, the in lieu fee should be tied to an in lieu option of seven or more units for your inclusionary housing fee. And those, anything with less than seven units, we're making, um, our, we're updating our ordinance to be more legally sound and adding an impact fee. The next policy item was the discussion on those asset limitations. So within our normal asset limitation, we have the 1.5 uh, times the annual household income and added a five, uh, $500,000 in qualified retirement plan uh, with an annual increase tied to CPI. Um, also added a new asset limit for designated affordable senior housing developments for 55 plus in age that are not in a mobile home park to three times the annual household income and increase the um, $500,000 exception in qualified retirement accounts to 1 million and to let that increase annually according to CPI. And then third, to continue to govern asset limitations of mobile home parks through recorded agreements and administrative policies as applicable. Um, and lastly, um, we also considered alternatives to on-site production and in lieu fees. And the two that we thought were, um, that could be utilized within Capitola, one being off-site development that the developer may provide affordable units offsite on another site in Capitola city limits. Um, that this is when two or more developers work together and it's just to provide an option um, to a developer. The second is a land dedication and this you see often occur within housing development. The land dedication is when the developer um, 
can dedicate, rather than provide the in lieu fees, could dedicate a couple acres of land to the city in which the city and a nonprofit um, or even the developer could contribute to develop the um, on site affordable housing. Um, I know that currently, I think there's a project in Watsonville that's structured this way. And in meeting with some affordable housing experts locally, I've heard that this is just a, a great tool to have in our toolbox. So there's other uh, requirements, but one of the most important requirements that we've listed within this option is that the overall increase in affordable housing units would have to be 10% above what a project could provide on its own within our inclusionary housing ordinance. Um, also, within the update, we've made quite a few administrative amendments. It was difficult um, if you owned an inclusionary unit to know exactly what was expected at for of you at the time of sale and at, at the time of purchase. So we've really cleaned up the ordinance to make this more easily understandable. We also plan on adopting um, a policy to really outline that for the public, for, these, for the owners of our inclusionary uh, unit. So we've updated the findings to be consistent with that most recent housing element and text, um, and just more specificity on on what the process is within the ordinance. So I won't go through all of these, but just really cleaned it up and made it easier to understand. Um, so from all of that policy direction from the city council, we've drafted two ordinances. Uh, one is for chapter 18.02, it's an amendment to our affordable inclusionary housing. And then adding an, um, chapter 18.05 of the Capital Municipal Code for affordable housing impact fees. And with that, our recommendation tonight is to introduce the first two readings of those ordinances and I'm available for any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Council members, any questions for Katie? Vice Mayor Story. Thank you again, Mayor Brooks. Um, Katie, yeah, thanks for um, your report and bringing this back to us. I, I had a couple of questions. Um, and one is uh, concerning uh, the proposed ordinance language on, this is on um, the packet page 50. Um, it's some uh, item E on that page. Um, and it's for, it states that the housing developer may, um, in addition to other options, have the option of reducing the entire interior amenity level of affordable housing units. Um, and I guess um, I just wanted to um, see if, if we had any potential issues with affordable housing, um, you know, becoming, um, let's say, um, scaled down in quality. Um, based on this option, um, and and particularly, you know, maybe why we have this, um, and if it's in relation uh, to the in lieu fee as an alternative to the in lieu fee, um, and if they were to build a unit instead, but they remove many of the am amenities for the affordable portion of it how that compares um, uh, in costs and benefits, um, you know, to the, to our housing stock. Um, and, um, you know, my other question is on the um, off-site development, uh, which I think I'm generally supportive of, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm unclear as to when would, uh, if there's a time limit to when they would have to actually bring that off-site uh, affordable housing online. So okay. Th yeah, those are my questions. Okay, for the, for the first one, um, so I'm showing the screen right now, you can see, I, I think you're asking about E, and the housing development project developer shall have the option of reducing the interior amenity level. And it pre previously it said and square footage, and I think back in that, August meeting, we got direction that we could um, remove the, you know, decreased square footage for the affordable housing unit. But for the amenity level, I think that's referring to um, 
maybe the brand of stove or dishwasher um, within your kitchen so that it could be if uh, if you're doing a really fancy development within the affordable unit they don't have to be the most high quality you know the best quality brand if that's what the rest of the development is getting so i think um, that is what that standard it relates to does that clarify your question Well, I, I think it, it clarifies my question. I, I'm not sure if it addresses my concern. And I guess I was going to, it, with our history with this particular ordinance, whether we've run into any situations or if there's a possibility here that the affordable housing is going to be significantly uh, downgraded um, based on this ordinance. You know, having, I mean, Having a a, a, um, a less high-end stove, that that you know that's probably acceptable. Um, but um, you know, in terms of you know what, could they remove closets um, or make the closet smaller? Or I think in um, many ways, make the affordable housing unit um, be. Um, I guess uh, less than uh, what the project is meant to be. Um, if you, I mean, I hope that it expresses my concern. And I'm just asking whether, uh, in our experience, there has been any issues along those lines in the past with this particular term. Um, so. I, I do know that a developer has in the past uh, opted to decrease the size of a unit in the past, and that's why we, it, it kind of looks funny when you go to see that development, see this one much smaller unit and know that that's the affordable unit. Um, in terms of the interior amenities, I know uh, when I went, walked through Terra Core, I, the developer did not take advantage of this section of code. Um, it was available to them to take advantage of, but they utilized the same products throughout within the affordable unit. They actually came to us to change which unit was affordable halfway through the project, and they weren't concerned of, you know, they hadn't planned to make any differences in um, the like grade of materials they were utilizing. So I, I do understand your concern, but I haven't experienced to date anyone taking advantage of it within the one unit that's been produced and put in here. So um, as for your second question, that is under the alternative. Um, I'm going to scroll down. So here's the alternative compliance options. The first one is regarding that off-site. And you asked about time limits. Um, so the time limit says the construction of the off-site affordable housing units may not have commenced prior to the first approval of the market rate housing development project. So they can't be, um, you couldn't have a project that was already in process and a developer come in and say, actually, we're gonna buy those units that are already in process and make those our affordable units because really what you're trying to achieve is creating more units for the city um, for inclusionary. And then the second part of that is, I think is addressed in this next paragraph that the final inspection for occupancy of the market rate units in the housing development project will be granted only after the final inspections are completed for the off-site affordable units. So those off-site units have to be produced prior um, to occupancy of the, the new unit. Good, got it. Yeah, okay. thank you. Thank that addresses my concern. Councilmember Bertrand. Yeah, I had a similar question to Sam's question, the second one, but I just was curious, what's magic about seven units? Um, seven units is the standard we've had in place since the ordinance came in to being, I think um, it's where you establish your 15% one in seven. So. Yeah. So I think uh, some of the comparable cities had 
four units. I, I can't remember right now. And so my point to the city council, I'm not proposing changing it, but we may think about this in the future is that, you know, the size of projects may preclude getting an affordable unit. It's probably much easier for someone to build something that's smaller and then just pay the in-move fees. But if we had it as a threshold that was lower than seven, we might get more affordable units. Um, so I had a similar question to Stan, so maybe a different take on it. Um, you mentioned that another entity could be one of the partners in providing the affordable unit. Is that correct? I think not alternative. And so if that's the case, I just want to confirm that. What do you mean by another entity, another developer or what? And that, so within the, um, the first scenario of the alternative compliance options, it's for off-site. So two developers, if, you're, if they were developing two different sites, they right. could work together to propose to have the affordable housing on a different site. Yeah, that's what I thought you meant. So, mm -hmm. so this means there's going to have to be a contract on one of the developers and you know, they could have a stumbling block and execution of their project and, you know, maybe one site is already flushed out and there's no affordable housing. So I was just wondering how that's going to be dealt with. Yeah, I, I honestly, I do not think that this alternative will be utilized that often, but we're, um, we're tasked with coming up with some alternatives. I do think the, the second alternative of being able to dedicate land is, is a tool that we'll probably see. Um, but the coordination that would have to occur and the timing for to have two different developers working together, not allowing occupancy until all the inclusionary units have been built, um, it, would, it would be a tricky one, but we would have definitely agreements in place that the, in which the developer would have to follow prior to sale of the market rate unit. Okay, well, yeah, that's my concern, and I think I share it with Sam. There is some legal coordination there. Thank you. Any other questions from council members? Okay, so I'll open this up to public, public comment for this item. If you'd like to make a comment, send an email now to public comment at ci.capitola.ca.us. Or to speak, please raise your hand now by clicking on reactions, then clicking raise hand in your Zoom application, or by dialing star nine or star six, depending on which landline or mobile phone you have. Our moderator will unmute you and you will have up to three minutes to speak. Mayor Brooks, I do not see any attendees wishing to speak on this item and I do not have any emails on this item. Okay. Then we'll bring this back to council for further comments and discussion. Council member Peterson. I'd like to move approval of the staff recommendation. I'll second that and I do have a comment. Okay, we have, um, before we do council member Peterson, I'm gonna ask for a quick friendly amendment. We need to take these um, items separately this evening for item C. Mm -hmm. So this would be item C. Uh, one, introduction of first reading, and if you could maybe um, make the first, your motion for item one, if that's, if you so choose. And we'll take them separately. Sure. So we'll make a motion to approve item C1 as recommended by staff. I agree. Council, Council member Bertrand, is that a second? Yes, it is. Okay, so we have a first and second for item C1 to introduce for first reading by title only waiving further reading of the text and ordinance amending chapter 18.02 of the Capitola Municipal Code Affordable Inclusionary Housing. Samantha, if you're listening, that was for you. <laughs> um, Council Member Bertrand, before I call roll call, would, is this the comment you wanted to make here for this particular section? Uh, well, in general, it's a comment if I may. I, I just want to thank um, staff for coming up with the, the grant and giving us guidance based on the Nexus study that uh, was very helpful. It was a detailed study, but I really appreciate it. And um, thank you again. Thank you, Council Member Bertrand. So can I have a roll call for item C1? Yes. Council Member Bertrand? Yes. 
Council Member Bertrand. I agree. Council Member Kaiser. Aye. Council Member Peterson. Aye. Vice Mayor Story. Aye. Mayor Brooks. Aye. This item passes unanimously. Now looking at item C2. Come on. I can make a motion on item C2 to introduce for the first reading by title only waiving for the reading of the text. An ordinance adding chapter 18.05 of the Capital Municipal Code affordable housing impact fee. First amendment. I'll second. So we have a first from Council Member Kaiser and a second from Vice Mayor Story. Any other further comments? Well, I'd like just to really quickly piggyback off of what Council Member Bertrand uh, mentioned was that this has been a lot of work over many, many months. And Katie and your team, you've done an exceptional job of really separating each issue, allowing enough time and space for conversation and um, really helping me understand uh, the complexities of such a really um, complicated issue. And this particular IHO will have a significant impact on, our, on the city of Capitol and its future. So really thank you for all your time. Um, okay, let's do a roll call. Okay, Council Member Bertrand. I agree. Council Member Kaiser. Aye. Council Member Peterson. Aye. Vice Mayor Story. Aye. Mayor Brooks. Aye. Thank you. Okay, this item passes. We'll now move on to item 8D. This is Green Waste Franchise Agreement. Ooh. Whose item is this? Larry, Yes, it is mine. Sorry, I was uh, trying to get my uh, screen ready to share. Um, so I'm going to try that right now. Uh, okay, so I hope you see the screen. Um, and so this is this is the Green Waste um, Recovery Franchise Agreement with the City of Capitola. Um, and just make sure everyone can see the screen okay? Yes. Okay. Um, just a little bit of history. Green Waste Recovery has been the uh, capital of franchise waste hauler since 2008. Um, updates were made to the agreement in 2010 and 2012. The current um, franchise agreement um, expires at the end of 2022. Um, just kind of a background. Green Waste is the hauler. They, they collect it and they transport it for disposal. Right now they take the garbage goes, the regular garbage, yard waste and organics go to the Monterey Regional Waste Manage Management District and recycling goes to Green Waste Facility in San Jose. Um, in addition, Green Waste is the franchise hauler in, for Santa Cruz County as well as Scotts Valley and they have a strong relationship with the Monterey Regional Waste Management District as well because they are the hauler for seven of the uh, member agencies of that, of, of where we dispose. Um, and going into that, uh, last year at this time, it seems, doesn't seem that long ago, but it was, it was a year ago, the city agreed to a new disposal agreement with uh, the Monterey Regional. Um, the disposal rates will be increasing um, over the next few years, um, finalizing at 95% of the, uh, the member rate um, at the Monterey Regional Waste Management District. At the same time, as part of the, the rate increases there as well as what we're talking about here, the state of California has passed a number of, um, you know, kind of recycling and, and waste management type laws. The most, the largest right now we're dealing with is SB 1383, which will really increase the cost of collection and disposal with some of the, just a few of these requirements. Where the, the goal of 1383 is to help remove um, organics from landfill. Um, we're required as what well, is to increase education and outreach to customers. We have to monitor contamination much more uh, diligently and uh, significantly than in the past. And reporting has to be uh, done to CalRecycle at the state level. This updated agreement extends the franchise agreement with Green Waste through 2030. This is actually the same timeline which we want it to be on as um, Santa Cruz County and the city of Scotts Valley. So if there is some changes, we can all kind of work together to, to figure out what to do because it is tough being a small, 
you know, an island around, surrounded by, um, you know, a, a larger agency. So we would like to work together if it comes down to that, which we, at this point, we don't see a reason it would. Um, included in the 1383 compliance requirements, um, organic collection um, for all customers based on the disposal capabilities at Monterey Regional. Um, at this point, residential organics is to begin uh, beginning of the year. Um, we got to remember that greenways can take whatever whatever they can to the disposal, but if the disposal site doesn't have the capability to process it correctly, it doesn't do any good. So I think everybody's on board working together. So as these um, capabilities at the uh, Monterey Regional change, we're going to come back and, and make sure our agreement reflects those changes. Um, the other thing is that we have to review and document customer containers much again much more diligently for contamination and then follow up um, with those with those folks and report on it as well public education as we talked about the big piece of this um, as is reporting to cal, cal recycle and i can tell you from firsthand our reports for, to, cal, uh, to cal recycle have gotten significantly larger in the next last couple of years and i'm sure they're going to continue to be that way for both ourselves as well as the hauler um, the other addition to this is um, Green Waste is in the middle of kind of a company reorganization. So we added a, a section to allow for a kind of a short term um, change in control and, and long term as well. And we will be working with some of the other agencies to do our research on this to make sure that it, 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 it's okay as they move forward in the process. So the big thing is with all these requirements, rates are increasing by approximately 23% January 1st of this year. Um, this includes the cost of disposal increases, the increased requirement, requirements. It also includes in 2020, because we were trying to get this done earlier, it, we deferred the uh, increase at January 1st, 2020. So it does include some of that. Um, it also um, includes increased organic collections. We mentioned hopefully first of the year, um, we're gonna start be able to do it for residential um, customers as well. One of the things they did is because the, the previous agreement with the Marina, uh, the Monterey Regional Waste Management District had a CPI es escalator, basically the same as our, our um, one with Green Waste, so they could put all of those together and, and come up with a rate. Well, now our rates are gonna be at the disposal site, will be increasing a little more and differently over time. So. Um, in the rates, we've separate, or well, Greenways has, and we've agreed to separate the collection from the the um, trans hauling and collection and transportation. So the disposal will be kind of a separate line item on the rates. For reference, 35 gallon carts, which are the most common, will be increasing by four dollars and eleven cents a month to twenty two twenty six a month. This, for reference, is still the lowest cost per disposal of that size in Santa Cruz County. So with that, um, the, the recommendation is to authorize the city manager to enter into an amended and restated franchise agreement with Green Waste Recovery for collection and disposal of garbage, recycling, organics, food waste, yard waste, and construction demolition debris. Um, I am here um, for any questions and also on the line are Emily Hansen and Tracy Adams of Green Waste Recovery if you have any questions for, for either of them. So at the point I'm here for any questions. Thank you, Larry. Councilmember Bertrand. Yeah, um, how do you define organic waste? I'm just trying to orient myself. Well, I can tell you that, that, is, that it's, a, it's a bit of a moving target, um, and that's gonna be part of what um, is gonna be coming down with education as well as what Monterey Regional can do. Um, I don't know um, if we have the details yet. Um, if I could, I, we, we could have um, we don't have our, our, our local general manager on the line, but it is, it is kind of a variable, it's kind of a moving target at this point. Um, would you like to hear from uh, the folks at Greenway if they have a, maybe a better definition at this point? To inform us, yeah. Well, right, right. Um, sure, our Emily or Tracy, would you be Emily? I'm gonna allow to Emily to talk. Emily? All right. Um, greetings, Ms. Mayor, members of the council. Uh, Jim Moresco is on the line. He's not on the Zoom link, so you might you might see his phone number, but he's definitely present. 
Um, thank you for the opportunity this evening to, to present this item. The, um, the challenge with this term of organics is that it is a bit of a moving target. So we've been threading the needle in partnership with the, um, the city of Capitola, working with the state of California, and also with, of course, the Monterey Regional Waste Management District. So an, an important facet of the new collection program and the reason that um, the primary reason that the rates are increasing is that every customer, every residential customer uh, that presently has a yard waste container will be able to add food waste to that yard waste container. So um, in, in terms of residential service, the, um, the current program is for what we call clean green yard trimming. So presently you would be able to put um, apples from your backyard or a pumpkin into your yard trimmings container, but the moment that any edible items go into the kitchen or inside your house, the regulations treat those differently. That becomes kitchen scraps and food waste. So the regulations through SB 1383, as Larry mentioned, have expanded to um, attempt to get as much organics out of landfill as possible. So the, the best opportunity that we had to make the program cost effective for the customers and allow um, our services to provide the city with SB 1383 compliance for residential customers is to add that food waste to the green container. On the commercial side, we will still have um, a source separated organics program as well. That is presently um, what we call a clean food scrap program. There will be opportunity for um, some customers, you know, not for example, the Esplanade customers, but um, for customers, you know, let's say a Gales Bakery that has some incidental yard trimmings as well, they would be able to use their new um, container for both their food scraps as well as their yard trimmings. The challenge in all of this is that the definition of what's allowed in those containers is driven by the processing facility, in this case, the Monterey Regional Waste Management District. So as Larry mentioned, we are um, working in partnership with the Monterey Regional Waste Management District to get a finite list of exactly what is going to be accepted in these organic containers and what is going to be what we call non-acceptable in those containers. And then as Larry mentioned, the burden of outreach and educating the community on what is and isn't allowed in each of the containers, um, that is the responsibility of green waste under the franchise agreement. Thank you. I have one other question, Larry, and a comment. So I think the um, the governor signed in a new or, uh, new law, and I understand that we're going to be limiting what plastics we actually recycle. Um, I think hard plastics and a couple other categories are not going to be recycled because we don't have a market for it, or there's no way to process it. Um, maybe I'm misunderstanding that. Is this correct? I, I'm, I'm happy to take that, Larry, if you'd like. Yeah, absolutely, because I'm not aware of it, right? So thank you very much. Yeah. So um, similar to the challenge with SB 1383, which is the um, Short-Lived Climate Pollution Reduction Act to keep the organics out of landfills, the state is um, looking to, to the extent possible, standardize things in the state. As you all, I'm sure, are aware, uh, looking, flipping over your yogurt container and looking at the chasing arrows sign um, to try to figure out whether or not it's recyclable or whether it's accepted in your program um, is incredibly difficult and confusing and complicated for the consumers. You could um, live in the city of Santa Cruz, but you work in the city of Capitola, uh, and those, pro those collection programs are different. So the state has been trying to standardize that so that the um, producers of those materials can take what we call extended producer responsibility and do a better job of labeling things. However, you guys will remain unimpacted because we process your recyclable materials. So we have Green Waste Recovery owns and operates a material recovery facility in San Jose. We bring the recyclables from the city of Capitola to our uh, facility in Watsonville. We load those on a larger trailer. We bring those materials over to our San Jose facility for processing. 
and we have um, perhaps if not the most expansive list of items that we accept in the blue recyclables containers and the reason that we do that is because of our commitment to sustainability and the fact that we do not own a landfill it is our goal to keep as much material out of the landfill as possible because we have to pay somebody else to bury it in the ground so since um, 2008 and even earlier when we developed our new and improved state-of-the-art processing facility we have um, really done a lot of investment in producing very clean commodities um, cleaner than the industry standard so we continue to enjoy markets for materials that a lot of um, companies that run these recovery facilities um, don't have access to so the i know that was a long way to answer the question but i think it's an important one which is the city remains unimpacted by that new um, legislation because we go above and beyond and we're not the lowest common denominator. Wow, that's great to hear uh, for those of us who have been recycling forever. Um, Larry, I do have one, uh, Mary, I do have one other request or comment. Um, is there a, a chance to tour this facility? I kind of like to see what's available there so that I could see it firsthand. Um, maybe the council would like to do that too. Well, I can tell you firsthand it's an amazing facility, but uh, um, I can we I can get with uh, Ms. Hansen to see if that's, uh, when, when, when they allow it, we can get in contact with her. That's okay, true. thanks. I appreciate that. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, we'll take this to the public for public comment. If you'd like to make a comment, please send an email now to public comment at ci.capitola.ca.us or to speak, please raise your hand now by clicking on reactions, then clicking raise hand in your Zoom application at the bottom of your screen. Or you can, if you've called in, you can dial star nine or six, depending on if you have a landline or mobile phone. Our moderator will unmute you and you'll have up to three minutes to speak. Mayor Brooks, I do not see anyone asking to talk on this item, and I do not have any emails on this item. Okay, so we'll return back to Council for further discussion and a vote. Council Member Bertrand. I'd like to move the recommended. Okay, we have a first. Um, Councilmember Peterson. I'll second that. We have a first from Councilmember Bertrand and a second from Councilmember Peterson to approve the, to authorize the city manager to enter into the amended and restated franchise agreement with Green Waste Recovery Inc. for collection and disposal of garbage recycling, organics, food waste, yard waste, and construction and demolition debris. May I have a roll call, please? Councilmember Bertrand. Um, I. Councilmember Kaiser. Aye. Councilmember Peterson. Aye. Vice Mayor Story. Aye. Mayor Brooks. Aye. Okay, this Mayor. item passes unanimously. Councilmember Bertrand, did you have something? Yeah, um, Larry, thank you for getting uh, staff uh, from the facility and you know, the company, I appreciated their answers and uh, definitely helped me understand things. Well said, Council Member Bertrand. We'll now move on to item 8E. This is a recreation registration system update. Welcome, Nikki. Good evening, Mayor Brooks, Council Members. Um, let me take a minute and prepare my screen. All right, so the item before you this evening is the Recreation Registration Management System. Um, so in 2008, Recreation contracted with um, Active Network, also known as ActiveNet, which is our current uh, registration system where anybody who would attend a recreation program, they would go online and register for that class or junior guard program 
um, they could also come into the community center, speak with one of our front desk staff, and would also access ActiveNet and register um, through the same ActiveNet process. So it is, even though it's either online or through our front desk staff, it is a web-based registration system. Um, and the implementation of this web-based system has significantly improved the registration service that we have been able to provide. Um, many of you may remember the long lines of junior guard um, registrations that apparently wrapped the building. So in 2008, when the city originally contracted with ActiveNet, it purchased an activities module um, and paid a one-time fee for that module. And then the ongoing service has been um, paying a transaction and credit card fees which are deducted from any income that ActiveNet collects from our residents registering. So they pay our fees um, by registering for something, and then ActiveNet deducts a set of fees, percentages of that transaction, including a credit card um, transaction fee. Then once that's deducted, the, a check is mailed to the city. Um, now, in F the fiscal year 1819, which was the last year that was uninterrupted by the pandemic, um, the city paid ActiveNet $39,308 in uh, those registration transaction fees. Um, in the two years since then, uh, each year has been about $25,000 in fees, um, but we have not been operating as normal due to the pandemic. And so staff estimates that if we, when we return to a post-pandemic operation, that continuing with active net would continue to cost about $40,000 in fees. Now, active net over the past few years has become a bit of a poor fit for the recreation division as we have been implementing new growth goals, particularly in relationship to um, the strategic plan and uh, new uh, activities that we have been providing, such as our after school program. Um, and so staff is seeking a system that would provide um, the mobile compatibility, which is a common request from residents, as our current system does not have great mobile compatibility, and um, better support system, uh, services, such as when front desk staff that are working with our active net system, um, when problems occur within the system, we reach out to those support services and they help us problem solve. So we would be looking for better support services from MNE systems um, in the future. So in order to begin this process, um, staff reached out to a lot of local agencies to identify some products that are currently in use and that have uh, good ratings and ultimately decided to review five of those recommended registration systems. And after reviewing five, um, acquired quotes from three of those, one of which was ActiveNet, our current one, and what uh, one of the options would be to add additional modules um, that would expand the services that we are currently able to provide in order to help some of the problem solving. Um, ultimately, from those three quotes, we selected the top two um, that would be the best in the long term and arranged for a demonstration with the whole recreation staff um, to, to, so that it would be a, a good perspective of that system. And then we additionally reached out to other cities that are currently using those top two products in order to identify user feedback um, and go a little bit beyond the sales pitch. So after all that process, um, decided that Civic Plus, specifically the Civic Rec um, resource, the product that they have, which focuses on parks and recreation registration management systems, um, is the best choice 
um, for our division. And um, Civic Plus is also the company that has recently purchased MuniCode, which is the city's um, current website provider. Um, so currently, because of the way the ActiveNet would deduct the transaction fees from any payment that it collected, as it currently serves as our merchant account as well as our registration system, the um, an active net payment to active net is not an expense line in the recreation budget. Um, the Civic Plus quoted us at for a first year cost of $24,963. 50 percent of this is due at signing. Uh, the first year cost is a little more because it will involve training for our staff as well as the overall setup of our registration system. And then each year after that is quoted at $14,527. Um, now, as I said a minute ago, ActiveNet not only is the registration management system, but it serves as our merchant account, our gateway. Um, Civic Plus partners with various gateways and I'll be working with our finance director um, in order to choose an appropriate gateway. That gateway or merchant account um, does additional payment transactions for any uh, for the payment process. So if it's a debit card, it's a certain percentage, usually pretty low, like 0.5%. If it's an American Express card, um, that credit card fee can be around 2.5%. Currently, any credit card processing fee for ActiveNet, we're paying 3%. So um, whatever merchant account we go with, staff anticipates that it is expected to be less than 3% um, for those payment transactions. And um, as we move forward, staff will incorporate any budget changes at the mid-year budget group. So the recommended action for this evening is to authorize the city manager to enter into an ongoing contract with Civic Plus to provide the city recreation division with a new registration management system. And I'm available for questions at this time. Any questions from council? Okay, seeing none, we'll open this to public comments. If you'd like to make a comment, oh, sorry, council member Bertrand, you had a Question? Yes, I do. Um, Nikki, it seems from your presentation that uh, we're going to benefit in a couple of uh, ways. Um, decreased upfront costs and also potential increases in efficiencies as you talked about gateways for the finance department. I was wondering if you could um, comment more about that. Well, yeah, so what's, um, what's really exciting about the opportunities that Civic Plus will be able or to provide us is that it is a all every everything that they have to offer, offer is in one package. Whereas ActiveNet, we would buy module by module. So, if, for example, we decided that suddenly we wanted to do point of sale um, opportunities. That if we were to do that with our current registration system, we would have to purchase a module in order to be able to do that, and then all the transaction fees would apply on top of that. With Civic Plus. Um, point of sale is part of it. So if first at some point down the road we decide, uh, I think we're going to start doing point of sale, uh, it's already part of that process. Um, so that's exciting for the recreation side. And then, yes, for my, I still have a lot to learn about gateways exactly, but from my understanding is that there will be um, some efficiencies in the finance department as for having, having a gateway relationship. Okay. Is there a bundled fee? It's sort of like getting insurance for your car and your house or something because we're going to be <laughs> using two different products, I guess? For, you mean between the gateway and the registration system? And, and it's doing our uh, website, I think, right? You mentioned because it just purchased. Oh, um, you know, I, I do. I don't know, but that's something that we can definitely look into, particularly if we end up using any other the Unicode product. Yeah, it, se it seems like that's a possibility. Uh, this sounds very exciting. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from council? 
Okay, so we'll move this to public comments. Um, if you'd like to make a comment, send an email now to public comment at ci.tapatola.ca.us. Or to speak, please raise your hand now by clicking on reactions, then clicking raise hand in your Zoom application, or by dialing star nine or star six, depending on if you have a landline or mobile phone. Our moderator will unmute you and you'll have up to three minutes to speak. Mayor Brooks, I do not see any attendees with their hands raised for this item, and I do not have any emails on this item. Okay, we'll bring this back to Council for further comment and a vote. Who would like to begin? Well, I'd, like member to, for Trent. <laughs> I'd like to move the recommend to, to see this uh, move forward, so I'd like to move the recommended action. Thank you. Excellent. We have a first. I will second that. And I have a second from Council Member Kaiser. Any other comments? Okay. Can I have a, uh, please have a roll call to approve the staff recommended action to authorize the city manager to enter into an ongoing contract with Civic Plus to provide the city recreation division with a new registration management system. Yes. Council Member Bertrand. Hi, Green. Councilmember Kaiser. Aye. Councilmember Peterson. Aye. Vice Mayor Story. Aye. Mayor Brooks. Aye. This item Great. passes unanimously. We'll now move on to item nine, which are 15 more items to go. Council, are you ready? Do you have it in you? No, not tonight? Okay, well, item nine is adjournment. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Congratulations again to our future chief, Andy Daly. And thank you, um, staff. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you to our city manager. Um, this was a big one tonight. There was a lot of really great things done for the city of Capitola this evening. So thanks to all the department heads. Have a great evening. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Good night.